Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the Sintero Forever Dublin presentation entitled Get Outside, Pollinate, and Get Green. Presented by the City of Dublin's Nature Educational Coordinator, Barbara Ray, and Michael Darling, an, an Operation Administrator for the City of Dublin. My name is Beth Baker, and I'm the Aging in Place Navigator for the City of Dublin. Originally, we planned to have this event outside for our first other gathering in 2021, but Zoom it is. I do wish to inform you that this presentation will be recorded and archived. If, so if you choose not to have your image recorded, please cancel the video option at the bottom left of your screen. Questions are encouraged, but we ask that you utilize the chat function so that the presentation may flow. As the Nature Education Coordinator for the City of Dublin, Barbara provides wildlife management as she assists residents with sick or injured animals that need rescue. For the past 35 years in the Central Ohio area, Barbara has shared her passion of nature and wildlife as she has developed a wide range of nature programs centering on pollinator gardening, habitat improvement, and environmentally friendly living as she interacts with residents, schools, and civic groups. Michael Darling is an operation administrator for the City of Dublin Street and Utility Department, where he manages the Rumpke Waste and Recycling Solid Waste Management Agreement, the Street Sweeping Agreement, and the Mosquito Control Agreement with Franklin County Board of Health. Michael is also involved with grant writing and coordination of citywide sustainability initiatives, including the food waste and recycling drop-off programs the solar-powered solid waste compactor installation at the New Bridge Street Park. In addition to the many committees Michael serves on, he is an active board member of the Association of Ohio Recyclers. Michael has developed an interest in landscape horticulture, gardening, and paver patio design. He and his wife, Laura, and son, Logan, live in Worthington, where Logan will graduate from high school in just a few days. I am thrilled that Barbara and Michael can educate us on the importance of pollinator gardens and other sustainability initiatives that we can all take part in. Please welcome Barbara Ray and Michael Darling. Barbara, how are you today? <laughs> all right, let me see if I can share my screen here. There we go. So today I was going to talk a little bit about our pollinator gardening and pollinator species. Um, I have utilized quite a few of the uh, photos from uh, USGS and US Fish and Wildlife Service. So you'll see uh, credits for a lot of USFWS folks. <clears throat> so my first question would be, do you love food? And I just pictured a couple things, but um, most of us would have to answer yes to some foods. And it turns out that about 75% of our food items across the country are uh, the product of pollinator species moving pollen around um, to reproduce those plants. Excuse me, Barbara. Yes. Uh, we need to advance to the second slide. And so I don't know if you can hit enter on your screen. Well, I'm already on like the third or fourth slide actually. Oh, okay. So I don't know why it's not advancing. Um, do you see that one? I see slide one and two. The Power of Pollinators and Do You Love Food? Okay. Is that working? Do you see the bird? I see, do I'm not. not full screen, so all I can see is my slide. <laughs> and it looks okay. like it's going forward. Okay. Well, just continue on with your presentation, then I'm, I'm not sure how to troubleshoot this. I think you have to change your view if you uh, stop share and then you start share again and then you select the PowerPoint this time. Okay, stop share. Share screen. 
share. And this button up here. That one? Yeah. Start from the beginning. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Are we at the beginning slide? Do you guys see the beginning slide again? I do. It's not on full screen. I again see the, the first slide and then one and two, but I don't see the, the it filling the screen on my end. <laughs> now you can see all the slides. And then just hit that one. Oh, it went back to the thing you're doing what you're doing. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, my laptop actually has issues and I have two help desk tickets into our IT <laughs> department. This might be part of it. <laughs> Okay, well, why don't you just continue then? And I'm okay. apologize for your the the slides. So um, when I choose that slide, can you see the beginning slide? I see the first slide and the second slide. Okay, and then if I choose the third slide, can you see that one? I do not. It is not advancing. That is so weird. We can just share the PowerPoint with the recording afterwards, Barbara, and you could just speak. Okay. Yeah. Same okay, there. so it's not your it's not your fault. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that's sure. so weird. And like I said, I might have a browser issue or something going on. I wonder. So if you could just please start at the beginning, then we'll be able to edit that and we'll just we'll put the slides in as you go. Okay. There we go. All right. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the power of pollinators. And the presentation today has utilized a lot of photos from uh, USGS and US Fish and Wildlife folks. So you will see uh, quite a few photo credits from those folks. Um, and my first question would be, do you love food? And I've just pictured a few items, but in reality, about 75% of our food products are the result of pollinator uh, species being making it possible for those plants to reproduce. So of course we all love some food, even if we don't love the foods pictured. <laughs> and our pollinator species uh, are animals that can move pollen around to fertilize plants. And some of our food industries are almost entirely reliant on pollinators such as some of the, uh, like a pecan uh, field is almost 100% reliant on pollinator animals to be able to allow pecans to be produced. So what is pollination? Basically pollination is the movement of pollen from uh, the male pollen parts to other plants to reproduce. Some of our animal pollinators include birds, bats, and insects like bees, flies, butterflies, moths, beetles, and wasps. So what are some of the other important things about our pollinators? In the United States, over 100 crop plants depend on animal pollinators with a value greater than $15 billion a year. Most of our natural ecosystems would actually collapse without animal pollinators. And there are some plants that are endangered because of diminished pollination. So if the pollen can't get moved around by those animals, the plants can't reproduce successfully. And maybe more importantly, chocolate depends on pollinators. And most of us love chocolate. In fact, here's the chocolate midge. This is the little midge fly that is responsible for the cocoa plant being able to reproduce. So what makes a good pollinator? First of all, they have to be highly mobile so that they can move pollen easily from plant to plant. It helps if they have body parts where the pollen can attach, such as feathers, scales, or the hairs like uh, little bees have. They also need to be adapted to feeding on the type of flowers that they're attracted to um, and the nectar and pollen as a food source. 
some of them may have specialized feeding structures. And of course, the most obvious example are hummingbirds with a really, really long adapted bill and a super long tongue that actually curls up inside their skull when they're not using it. They also sometimes will visit a limited number of plant species so that they're very specifically pollinating um, those particular kinds of plants. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So some of our pollinators, um, the plants actually are shaping the species that pollinate them. And what's happened over time is we think about bees visit flowers that are yellow and red and bright colored and hummingbirds are attracted to certain flowers. But these plants have shaped themselves for specific species. So you're not going to find hummingbirds necessarily um, feeding off of a daisy, but you'll find a bee feeding from a daisy. Hummingbirds are going to be selecting cup-shaped and tubular-shaped flowers. And so those flowers want those species to be moving that pollen. That's how they maximize their strategy to disperse their pollen. Trees and grasses largely rely on wind. So they produce abundant small pollen particles. And if you're parked near any trees and you go back out to your vehicle, uh, you'll notice that yellow tiny pollen particles all over the windshield. Um, it's also of course high allergens for humans because that pollen is blowing through the air. And even if you don't have specific allergies, um, when the trees are shedding that pollen, which is right now, <laughs> um, it can make breathing a little challenging. So one of our pollinators are our bats. And even though our North American bats are all insectivorous bats, which means they capture insects on the wing or climbing a tree or even on the ground, um, silver-haired bats actually like to climb down a tree trunk right onto the ground and hunt around for grubs and insects but they're also transferring pollen because they are moving from uh, tree to tree when they perch. And they're also catching bugs that may um, have some of that pollen on them as well. Hummingbirds I mentioned already, but actually a lot of bird species um, actually transfer pollen. And although the hummingbird is the only one really specifically adapted to feed on nectar and pollen in North America, uh, the vermilion flycatcher in the earlier slide uh, is an ins insect eating bird. So a lot of these birds will be landing on the plants that their insect prey is on. And so they'll go from plant to plant and disperse pollen that way. And of course our bee family is our probably most well-known pollinators. And they of course have varieties of, of hairs and uh, pockets on their bodies to capture some of the pollen while they're feeding on the nectar. A lot of our native bee species are actually ground dwellers and they live in small colonies or individual queen with a few workers. So we're not going to see um, huge hives of native bees like we see with um, imported European honeybees. These are just some of the different colors and types. And on this bee, you can see he's got uh, some pollen already attached on his uh, rear thigh where he's going to store that as he gathers it and take it back to his, his nest. This is the European honeybee. And of course, lots of people keep bees and many of our large crops like that pecan field I was mentioning, um, they actually hire bees. They bring uh, beehives, beekeepers bring beehives in specifically to those crop areas to pollinate those crops. So these are different kinds of mining bees. They look like little miniature bumblebees. Most of them are about the size of our pinky, the end of our pinky finger. They're not necessarily huge. We obviously do have bumblebees, um, carpenter bees, by the way, which are very commonly found around our buildings and our homes, and they scare people. They're very large, but the ones buzzing around outside are actually the males, and they don't have stingers. So a female carpenter bee is going to be up inside the, uh, they bore holes up in the wood, and then they make like an L shape. So they, they bore an, a hole vertical, and then they build a tunnel horizontal. 
And the female, most of the spring and summer is going to be in that tunnel laying eggs. So if she were to come out, she does have a stinger and she can be a little bit unfriendly, but uh, by and large, she's never gonna be flying around, hovering around a building like the boys are. And of course they're constantly bringing back uh, food sources and they're also boring additional tunnels because as many tunnels as they bore for their queen, she'll continue to lay eggs and store, uh, she'll use the food stores in there. One of the interesting things about how our flowering plants have adapted to attract pollinators is the colors that they use. Now this flower we see as a yellow petaled flower, but this is what a bee sees. Um, or some birds, birds and bees uh, and butterflies see ultraviolet light. So on the right side of the slide is the yellow petaled flower that we see. And on the left side, the petals look white on the margins and black in the center. And as you can imagine, that dark color in the center really focuses the bee on the middle part of the flower that contains the pollen and the nectar. And that's the part the flower wants bees and birds and butterflies to come to. Um, this flower has multiple ultraviolet colors, but again, the stamen in the middle and the pollen is very, very dark and it has uh, very bright colors on the flower petals so that it kind of uh, reminds me of a, a runway lit up at night for a pilot to land a plane. It just targets you right into that center of the lane that you need to be in. And here's another example. Again, the, the flower looks uh, white to us and ultraviolet light in the center darkens the center as a target for our pollinators to be attracted to. Some of our other pollinators are moths and butterflies. Here's a, a couple moths on uh, cone flower. And some of our fritillary butterflies feeding a swallowtail uh, feeding on some of our native plants. Um, <clears throat> this is actually a fly. This fly looks like a bee when you first glance at him, but if you look right behind the main wings against the body are the second set of wings. So flies have two sets of wings and this fly species has a, mod it's a modified hind wing called a baltera. And these flies are responsible for a lot of pollination. Uh, most of us don't particularly care for flies and house flies certainly are uh, incredibly annoying and they don't spend much time pollinating. They spend more time eating refuse. Uh, but there's thousands and thousands of other fly species. Most of them are very, very small uh, that are responsible, just like that chocolate midge, uh, which is uh, related to flies that pollinates cocoa plants. Beetles are also huge pollinators. And again, sometimes beetles um, become invasive, like the Japanese beetles are very pretty, but they eat the leaves off of our trees and devastate our trees. But there's, again, thousands of other beetle species that are important pollinators. And here's a few of them here, all clustered on these little flower petals. And again, they have uh, rough spots on their bodies that will keep the pollen attached to them. So as they go from flower to flower, they're uh, releasing some of that pollen. So what do pollinators need? If we're gonna plant a garden, what do we need to consider for them? Well, first of all, they need the right kinds of food that contains uh, flowering plants that contains nectar, pollen, and a larval food source. So these are gonna be usually native plants if we're going to accommodate our native species. They also need nesting sites. And again, a lot of these bee species are ground nesters. Uh, we also have cavity nesters. And ground nesters sometimes just need a little scrape of dirt in the ground. So if we're planting a garden that's a natural naturalized uh, type of meadow flowers. Um, we don't need to mulch that. In fact, we can even create bare spots in it. And again, these don't need to be huge. We're talking about the palm of our hand bare. Um, cavity nesters, 
there was kind of a push for a while for people to put up B boxes. But as it turns out, most boxes with the little holes drilled in them for native bee species that are cavity nesters uh, can actually harbor some um, either invasive species or it creates a situation where the bees that are trying to live in there uh, get parasitized. So definitely do some research if you're thinking about putting up bee cavity nesting boxes. I don't usually recommend it and we don't we do have a few in Dublin that some scout groups have put up um, but I think we need a lot more research on our bee boxes um, to make sure we're not creating an unhealthy situation where they're getting attacked by mites and other parasites. They also need overwintering sites and a lot of times this is taking our native garden and letting it stand for the winter. So a lot of times people like to cut plants really low in the fall to get ready for winter. But the best thing we can do for pollinators is to leave those flowering plants and prairie plants, even the tall ones intact through the winter and then cut them back in the early spring. Um, that also um, provides cover for other animals, of course. And they also need protection from pesticides. So most of the time, if we have a native plant stand or a pollinator garden or a rain garden, we're gonna really avoid using herbicides and pesticides in that garden because these animals are very sensitive to it. Pollinator conservation uh, is really important because our pollinators are declining, partly from habitat loss. Um, habitat fragmentation is a huge problem for many wildlife species. Invasive species can become a problem. And then of course we mentioned the chemicals. Uh, there's also diseases and parasites. And some of the native diseases and parasites of our birds and butterflies and bees um, is exacerbated by some of the climate change and habitat loss and, and things, even invasive species can bring in um, some kind of disease or parasite that our native species are not accustomed to. So it's the same thing we've learned with the pandemic is if you move around and you have a contagious virus, it's easy to pass it on to other people in other areas who haven't had it yet and don't have any immune system built up for it. So what can we do? Um, obviously planting a pollinator garden is huge, even if it's just a little mm -hmm. patch. And I, I live on a farm, but I also have little patio planters. They're not huge but I plant native flowers in them. And it's amazing. I might have like five of these in front of the house and I have a lot of dogs and they would just smash through a garden that's by the house. So I use the little planters and they have cone flower and bee balm in them. And they're just visited by thousands of animals throughout the summer, these different bees and butterflies. So it doesn't have to be a big whole garden. Um, again, providing the overwintering habitat by creating a brush pile or leaving those plants stand. Um, and then a water source is always great. Now they can usually fly or move to a water source. Um, and here we have depicted one of these bee boxes that has all the little holes drilled in there. And you can see uh, and some of the holes are capped, which means the, the queen has laid some eggs in there and, and they've capped it uh, with some wax that they create from um, the pollen and nectar and bee spit basically. Um, but again, I think I would like to do more research on the boxes before I highly recommend them. So how do you wanna create a garden? You wanna choose plants that flower at different times of the year, ideally, partly for our own enjoyment, but it also helps different species of uh, birds and insects that come at different times. So one of the things about global warming that has really made it difficult for a lot of our bird species is Birds migrate back to Ohio, usually in May, and their timing is made perfectly with the flowering uh, plants that the insects they are going to feed their babies feed off of. Unfortunately, um, everything's kind of been moved up a couple weeks. And so sometimes these plants are flowering uh, right when or before the birds get here, and it's a little late then by the time they're nesting. So. Um, the more things we can plant, we're actually helping some of these bird species as well. Planting in clumps rather than in single plants, uh, it makes the gardens look nice, but it's also 
more attractive to the pollinators, providing a variety of colors and shapes, and of course, choosing native plants whenever possible. We certainly can plant some exotic plants safely in our gardens, they, they're beautiful, and sometimes these pollinators will feed off of them. Um, but our native plants are also gonna be a, a food source for the caterpillars in the larval stages that's really critical uh, for the animal to mature into a bit. A lot of people have a specific interest in monarchs, so I just wanna talk briefly about monarchs. Monarch butterflies are probably the most widely instantly recognized butterfly uh, worldwide. Um, people all know what a monarch is. This is a map of their flyway and coming through Ohio is going to be primarily their flight uh, south down to uh, Mexico in the winter. And most of the conservation of this animal is a, a tri-national effort between Canada, the United States and Mexico. And of course, this is how these animals cluster by the thousands in the uh, trees when they're resting on their migration routes. Um, but we can help these animals by planting the native milkweed plants. Um, there's common milkweed, white milkweed, swamp milkweed. There's two or three species that is especially fa favored by monarch butterflies but those are the same species that are also really important to uh, different bird species, butterflies, um, and even, even birds like um, these pheasants and flycatchers and uh, other birds that also eat insects. This is just a small list of some of the great pollinator plants for Ohio that can grow in anybody's garden just about anywhere in central Ohio. They're also beautiful plants. So uh, New England asters, butterfly weed, um, hawthorn, cockspur hawthorn, um, purple prairie clover, purple cone flower. I personally like bee balm because I love the, the square stems and the, the red flowers and they just have a great smell. And also a lot of herbs. There's a lot of herbs that will flower and attract uh, uh, pollinators as well. One of the best sources to get great lists for the different shapes, colors, and growing seasons for the variety of flowers is to go to the Xerces Society. So um, X-E-R-C-E-S, their website has all kinds of ideas for what plants to plant in a native pollinator garden, which ones need sun, which ones can handle shade, um, and these are all designed for the Great Lakes region in Ohio. Um, so depending on what type of garden you're trying to develop, their plant lists will help you with colors. Um, also, some of the plants obviously have more scent to them, which the scent, some of the scents are uh, certainly important for attracting bees. Birds don't have a sense of smell, so it doesn't affect them as much. Uh, but we like them too. So there's uh, really, that's, probably the, one of the best resources. And you also can work with the garden stores in your area too. There's um, Dutch Mill over in Marysville. W the city of Dublin works a lot with uh, Scioto um, uh, greenhouses. So there's also Straters, Oakland Nursery, there's different nurseries in the central Ohio area. And, and those folks also can help guide the types of gardening that you would like to uh, produce. So I'd like to thank U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS for a lot of the uh, photos material for this presentation. And um, thank you to all of our um, folks that are participating in the presentation. And if anybody ever has any uh, questions or additional, would like additional information to try to develop a, a pollinator garden or a rain garden. Obviously a rain garden utilizes a lot of pollinator plants, but specifically in areas that ha happen to hold water uh, part of the time. But those, those areas are often related as far as helping pollinators. Um, we can get you all kinds of information just right here in Dublin. Uh, we have a, a horticulture staff that's extremely experienced. They help, uh, uh, reproduce endangered species plants here in Dublin, uh, or if anybody has any wildlife questions, that's going to be more my purview as well. So thank you very much and happy gardening.
Thank you so much, Barbara. That was a wealth of information. Barbara is the Nature Education Coordinator for the City of Dublin. And we're so pleased to have you uh, present that to us and we'll make sure that those slides coincide with your, with your talk. I'd like Thank to introduce you. then again, Michael Darling, uh, an operation administrator for the City of Dublin, the Street and Utilities Department. Michael, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay. If you'd like to show your screen. Okay, um, here we go. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, the, yes. it says the, okay, and there's only one slide up. Should say Rain Barrel and City of Dublin Food Waste Drop-Off Presentation. That should yes. be the only thing up, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Michael Darling. I'm an operations administrator for the City of Dublin Street Utilities. And the presentation today will start off talking a little bit about rain barrels, um, uses, why they're important, and basically some, some facts about water and why water is, is such an important resource and why we need to, to do as much as we can to ensure that water stays pure and that we use what we're given because uh, with more people being in the world, we're using more water. And um, some, of the, some of the information is, is really kind of startling once you think about it, once I started looking into this. Um, and then the second part of my presentation will have to do with food, food waste uh, and food waste composting. So um, go ahead and buckle up and here we go. So um, rain barrels are basically, uh, you can use anything, you can buy them online, you can buy them at Lowe's or Home Depot. They're, they're basically uh, 50 gallon plastic barrels that can hook up to your um, gutters and downspouts. And the reasons that we do this is because it's an economical way to capture rainwater for gardening and lawn use. Um, of course, you're welcome to hook your garden hose up to your faucet and use that to water, but uh, rainwater is essentially free. So you can um, kind of put together a rain barrel and hook hose to it and use rainwater to go ahead and, and water your vegetables and flowers. And, you know, if you're, if you're, I guess, savvy enough, you can hook it up into a, uh, a water system in your house and, and drink it after you um, add the right chemicals like bleach and things like that to it in appropriate levels. Um, and the reason it's so important is it's a way to uh, utilize the resource without having to pay for it. Um, another reason that rain barrels are such a good idea is any, once, once it rains, all of that Water rushes off of your roof, down your downspout, onto the street, into the storm sewers, and it, it creates a massive surge in the storm sewer. It also, in some cases, will back up into people's basements and, and other um, garages and things like that if, they, if the amount of water overpowers the capacity of the storm sewer. So, you know, having a rain barrel will assist with that. Um, it also reduces the amount of contaminants that would otherwise get carried into local, weather, local rivers and streams. And, um, you know, last year we, let's see, I have a statistic about that. And we were, through our street sweeping program, we were able to capture the amount of grit on the street that would have otherwise been swept away into the storm sewers. We were able to capture, let's see, how many tons was that? We were able to capture 142.38 tons of, uh, of grit and material from being washed into, into the storm sewers and into our, our rivers. So anything that ends up on the street ends up in the rivers and storm sewers sewers and things like that. So anything we can do to divert that is, is a very positive thing. And it also reduces erosion. 
Can you see the next slide? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Water facts. Yep, perfect. I just want to make sure. Um, water facts, basically more than 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. I'm sure many of you have heard that in your science and biology classes. Of that 70%, only 2.5% of the su supply is considered fresh water. So basically 67%, 68% is salt water. So a whole lot of salt water out there, a whole lot of people, only a little bit of fresh water. Um, most of that 2.5% is locked up in the ice caps, glaciers, clouds, and humidity in the soil. So, and out of that, three tenths of 1% is actually available in lakes, rivers, and streams. So if you think about the Great Lakes, and you know the Scioto River and the Ohio River and and all of the lakes in Minnesota that account and basically all over the world, you know that accounts for three tenths of one percent for all the millions and millions and millions of people we have running around on the earth that that need fresh water. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the staggering things that you know, one of the staggering statistics that kind of sticks out where you're like, wow, we really have to protect this. Um, do we get enough rain in Ohio to utilize rain barrels? And, you know, the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, and the easiest way to harvest water basically from the rain is off of your roof by hooking up uh, a water or rain barrel to your downspouts. So your roof, if you have a thousand square feet of roof area and it rains one inch, you can harvest up to 600 gallons of fresh water. So that's, that's a considerable amount of, of uh, rain and, and fresh water that can be harvested that would otherwise be washed into streams and, and rivers carrying oils and grit and things with it. Um, how you come up with how many gallons of water that you can harvest is you measure the square feet of your roof. Basically, you know, there's other things that, that go into that, like gutters and, and, you know, the overhang and things like that. But the easiest way is just to figure out the square feet of your roof. And you do that by measuring your house, um, the length by width of your house. And let's say your house is 60 feet long by 30 feet wide. It has a surface area of 1800 square feet. Um, and when it rains one inch, you can uh, harvest about 1,080 gallons of water. So, and you know, that, that is the equivalence of about 22 rain barrels on a rain event. So, you know, we do get that quite a bit. So, you know, not having a rain barrel, you know, is, is if, well, rather if you have a rain barrel, that would be a really easy way to, to be able to water your lawn and and uh, your plants and and just about anything else that you wanted to do. Let's see. Oops. This slide may not work. I don't think it is, it's going to work because it just bumps up to the next slide. Um, and I apologize about that. But basically, what this is is it's a diagram of. Uh, a couple trash cans you can make your own too just by utilizing trash cans and you cut a hole in the top um, position it underneath your downspout and then if you're able to see on the bottom of this it would have a spigot that you can drill in and you can get kits online and you can hook a, a garden hose up to the spigot and it'll and you can also connect these two barrels with a piece of PVC and it's just too bad you can't see it. Um, but you can string along different numbers of cans and you know basically harvest infinite amounts of, of rain and, and store it and use it for however you would like to use it. All right. And where to where to purchase these is just about anything can be converted into a rain barrel. You know, on the bottom right, you see that blue container. What that is, is it's actually a, a soap container that they use for car washes and um, other detergents and things like that. You can get a clean one of those. Uh, basically, if, if you know somebody that owns or works at a car wash, they get these things in all the time. You might be able to buy one or get one for free at the car wash. 
and you can convert that into a rain barrel. Um, you can buy parts online. There's a, a wine barrel that somebody's used, or you can just buy them straight from Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, lots of local hardware stores have them. Um, I will be looking at writing a grant. So we may have rain barrels. I know we had them available once upon a time here, um, but I will be writing a grant if available and I'll see if what, what I can do to get some rain barrels, you know, for the city so that we can distribute to our residents because that's part of, of what I do and ignore the awarded it there. It's just supposed to have one ED. So kind of silly. Anyway, um, so we'll work on that and I will let you know if, if we do receive a rain barrel grant for where we can distribute some of these to area residents because it really does go hand in hand with recycling and environmental uh, sustainability and a lot of the initiatives that the city of Dublin is working on. Are there any questions regarding rain barrels before I move on to composting? I'll take that as a no. Okay. Okay. I guess, thank you. Did you have a question? I'm just looking for those who are, are callers and I don't know if there's any, uh, I don't see any. So. Okay. All right. We will move on to food waste composting. And basically uh, composting, it, it in fact impacts way more than you think. And what composting is, is an aerobic decomposition of organic materials by worms, by microbes, fungus, bacteria, and microorganisms. It transforms these raw materials such as leaves, grass clippings, garden trimmings, food stamps, and agricultural residues into a valuable resource known as compost, which is an earthy smelling soil conditioner that is teeming with life and it makes your garden much more workable. Um, many of us, especially in central Ohio, we're used to digging in clay. Uh, central Ohio soil has a very high, high clay content. And by adding compost and, and mulch and things like that, um, you increase the organic matter, which makes the soil a lot more workable and easy to work with. And it, it's a good food for plants as well. And the reason that the city of Dublin decided to get into the food waste and food scrap recycling composting business, uh, because the Franklin County Sanitary Landfill from Columbus and surrounding community, well, basically from Columbus and some of the surrounding communities that exist within the 270, Route 270 belt. And in Franklin County, they receive over 1 million pounds of food scraps within Franklin County each day. And food scraps account for about 15% to 18% of the total landfill capacity. So you think about all the things that go to the landfill, about 18% or so is food scraps, food waste. Um, and food scraps were identified as the largest opportunity to increase our diversion. Dublin, the city of Dublin has a goal of about 55% diversion. That means um, being able to capture about 55% of everything produced and keep it from the landfill. So if we can do that, we'll, be, we'll meet our goal. The Franklin County landfill has a goal of about 50% or so. And about 50% of the typ typical municipal garbage that is collected at the curb is compostable. So 20, you can see the graphic, 21% is food scraps alone, 15% is paper or paperboard that can be composted, 8% is yard trimmings, 8% is, is uh, food waste, and landfills and incinerators are less than ideal, they're kind of dangerous. Every bag thrown out contributes to pollution of surrounding soil, air, and water. Uh, climate change is a big one. Um, there's a lot of attention on that right now. And it also has health and hazards in, to humans and animals. So next up. Um, whoops, 
I'm just going to try this, see if that works. That did not work. All right. Um, further, the city of Dublin's why. Uh, we have about 14,180 residential homes, and which out of these homes, each or collectively, we produce about 11,969 tons of trash. Um, we produce about 4,851 tons of recycling. That means your glass bottles, plastic bottles, cardboard, paper, magazines, yogurt tubs, things like that. Um, about 3,371.9 tons of yard waste. And just that alone, what Rumpke collects comes up to about 40.77. I mentioned that, um, you know, collectively Dublin is at about 51.5. We also, all of the leaf collection is figured in and that was, Let's see. Leaf collection accounts for about a thousand tons. Um, all of the chipping, the big chipper that goes around and chips up branches after storms and things, that accounts for about 653 tons. And then we also have an electronic waste program, a scrap metal program from like the utility poles and traffic lights that are no good. We make sure that gets recycled. And then we have paper shredding and household hazardous waste events too. So when you factor all of that in, we're, we're right about 51.5%. So here's, here's some numbers from 2020, basically reiterating what I just said in the last slide. So you can kind of take a look. Um, we've already had our household hazardous waste collection for paints and herbicides, pesticides, oil, old gas, all that stuff. Um, that is collected by a contractor and then it's used to, they break it down and, and create new chemicals out of it, new paint and things like that, or thinners. Um, we've had one paper shredding event so far and it produced about 15 tons. And we still have one shredding, paper shredding event um, to happen and that one is in October. So make sure you watch a website for the date on that. Um, again, electronic waste tons like old computers, calculators, um, TVs, things like that can be dropped off at the service center here at 6555 Shire Rings Road in the lobby. Um, we do make sure that everything is collected and we use a contractor that tears them apart and makes new components out of them. Food waste recycling in 2020. Um, we, from August, the end of August and through December, we collected about 15 tons. Um, I'll share the numbers with 2021 with you here in a few minutes. And again, there's the scrap metal recycling tons, um, yard waste, chipping, leaf collection, things like that. So if we were to able to, if, sorry, if we were able to divert all of the food waste, we would be able to push that number up to 63.47%. So that would be, that would really be over and above the goal that we want to achieve a 55%. So, you know, the compost and food waste capture is a, is a very important item in what we do. So how, how did all this get started? Uh, Swaco, the Central Ohio, it's um, Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio. They have a grant program and I wrote a grant um, to introduce composting and all of the funding is provided through a grant from Swaco. And the purpose is to divert that amount of organic material from uh, entering the landfill so they can exceed or expand the amount of landfill life that, that is available. Because as soon as that landfill fills up, they're out of business. So it, it behooves them to um, divert as much as possible, even though ironically they make their money by what goes into the landfill, but they stay in business by keeping things out. So that's the paradox that they're faced with. Um, the initial grant was for $9,012 and um, we requested 500 compost buckets and we anticipated to have about 500 people um, involved in it and you could sign up online and then with your 
with your registration, you would receive a free bucket and then you would receive also emails and things regarding, you know, the progress of the program. If it's, if we've added or subtracted anything and also Rumpke updates. Um, our initial goal was to divert about 78,000 pounds during the first year. So that would be August of 2020 through August of 2021. We need to average about 1,500 pounds per week to reach that goal. Right now, we're at about 1,820 pounds. So we are exceeding our, our goal. Um, you can sign up on the website at cityofdublinohiousa.gov backslash compost. Uh, you'll be able to click on that. Um, the, the link is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all registered residents to register online. Um, again, you receive timely updates regarding changes in food drop-off operations and progress, as well as Rumpke News and any City of Dublin uh, initiatives that involve green technology or green initiatives. Um, we have about three buckets left. Not everybody that signed up came in to get their bucket. Um, we have about 715 people signed up right now. So that's pretty good. And what happens to all this stuff? The, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but this is the bucket that you would receive. There's three, like I said, there's three left. Can you see the cursor or not? We can. Okay. So you get a five gallon bucket and inside that bucket is a compostable liner, which, you know, um, you can buy replacement liners at uh, Whole Foods or Fresh Time or Kroger, and you can put all of your table scraps in there, and then you can just dump the bucket, and it keeps your fingers from having to touch the food and different things like that. And it also keeps the bucket nice and tidy and clean. Then you can just rinse it out. You don't have things stuck to the side of your bucket. Um, but we contracted with Go Zero, and it's a company from Dayton. And all of Dublin's food waste is transported to Dayton, where it is separated and basically managed by uh, inmates at a correction facility, and where they're responsible for the aeration and separation if necessary, and then basically turning food waste into compost where it can be sold and things like that online. Initially, we started out with 500 five gallon buckets that were available to the first 500 residents. But like I said, not everybody came to pick up a bucket. So we have about three left. So if you rush to the website, you can register and then you can come in. And the reason for the buckets is it's a clean, easy way to store food crop scraps, minimizing odor until disposal at the drop off facility, which is here at the center at 6555. Shire Rings Road. So forget that uh, approximately 30 buckets remaining. There's approximately three. I did not update this. So, and then here is a picture of the compostable bags that you can use for liners. Um, we recommend the six gallon size because the bucket is a five gallon bucket. You just have a little extra bag to, to, to kind of roll down the sides of the bucket and it keeps it from falling inside and, and getting mixed up with the food and things. It's just cleaner, easier, simpler way to, to manage it. Um, you do get a, a free liner initially with your Go Zero compost bucket. And again, they're available at Fresh Time, Kroger, Whole Foods, and the cost is approximately $25 per 100 liners. And this is kind of what the, what the location looks like. This is at, located at the Dublin Service Center at 6555 Shire Rings Road. It is a 20 foot by eight foot wide co container corral. Um, this area here, you can walk in, dump your food in these green containers. Um, it's highly visible so you can see out, people can see in, you know, there's no place, you know, where you, where you could, could get trapped or, or you know, you're going to be able to see any, it's for safety, basically, <laughs> you're able to see in, out, nobody's going to be able to hide in there, it's well lit, and it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and many communities have adopted this, this was our design, many communities like uh, Hilliard and I think Grove City have adopted this design 
and go zero loves it because it, it works well for them. Um, and all of that started right here in Dublin. So let's see what else you might be asking what's acceptable and, and what to keep out. Basically if it's, if it's a organic food item, it's, it's, it's acceptable into the containers, any kind of fruits, vegetables, grains, pasta, baked goods, coffee grounds, coffee filters, tea bags, eggs, eggshells, dairy, cooked raw meats, uh, shellfish, you know, like oyster shells are fine, crab leg shells are fine, seafood is fine, um, animal bones is fine, uh, greasy pizza box lids, like a lot of times when you order pizza, either the bottom <laughs> or the top will be really greasy. Um, cut those up into little pieces and put them in the green containers because uh, Rumpke doesn't like those with their recycling because it can contaminate and make their items hard to market and send off to other places that make new pizza boxes out of them. Uh, soiled non-coated paper products, napkins, tissues, pumpkins are a big one. Um, those are compostable, dead flowers, and then what's called BPI certified compostable plastic items. Um, and it'll have a little symbol on the bottom of the package that says BPI certified, and that's Go Zero's um, preferred item, you know, or per certified item to accept. It's easy for them to compost, um, and they they make uh, bowls, knives, spoons, plates, straws, and other things out of BPI compostable plastic kind of items. Things that please don't put this into the green containers and, and don't try to compost these. Rocks are not compostable. They've been around for millions of years. Nobody's been able to break them down yet. <laughs> uh, glass is a no. Metal, steel, tin, aluminum foil, electronics, styrofoam, personal health care products, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, like Kroger bags. Don't put that in there. It, it really causes problems with the process. Uh, anything that's coated paper or fiber products, anything with that paraffin coating, you know, probably keep out of there. And then um, as far as the non-BPI certified plastic items, you know, make sure before you put it in there, whether it's a liner, or whether it's a, you know, plastic silverware, make sure you see that it's BPI certified first. And our results, we kicked this thing off in August of 2020. Uh, it was originally located at the City of Dublin Recreation Center lot. Uh, there was some concern about the smells and animals and things. We moved it here to the service center. Um, we began with six 65 gallon Go Zero carts that were serviced every other week. And by the end of 2020, which would be December 31st, just in what, four or five months, uh, we had 639 active registrants. Uh, we collected almost 30,000 pounds of residential food waste. Uh, we were averaging about 1,740 pounds of food collected each week. Right now we're at 1,820 and we are not even to June yet. Our initial goal was 78,000 pounds and right now we're sitting at about 64,000 pounds. So we should eclipse easily the 78,000 pound mark which was the initial goal. We are currently servicing 12 65 gallon carts every week, as opposed to six that we started with every other week. And, you know, back when this was written at the end of 2020, um, the amount of food, the 29,584 pounds of residential food waste that was diverted was enough to, was the equivalent of the environmental impact of taking one car off of the road for 1,345 days. So you save that much fuel and exhaust and, you know, just all the energy is that, that you save by composting is the equivalent of taking that, that car off the road. Um, and the city, oops, I'm sorry, the city of Dublin food scrap composting platform, again, is being utilized as a model for other communities doing the same thing throughout Ohio. So we're kind of you know, really proud of that and our program is highly successful and is really a leading program in, in the state. So we're excited about that. Uh, 21 growth. Like I said, we're at 715 active registrants right now. 
We've increased productivity to 1,820 pounds of food waste. Um, we're at 36,400 pounds collected so far just this year since January. Um, and again, we're at around 64,000 for the year, 65,000 actually, 976 pounds for the year. Um, and that is the equivalent of removing one car for 385 or 3,852 days, which was, you know, what the 36,400 pounds would equate to. So we're at 84.5% of our goal. A little bit about pumpkin composting. Uh, pumpkin composting event is gonna be held this autumn and Go Zero really likes to compost pumpkins because one of the major problems is they need to consistently add water to the process because as things compost, it tends to dry out. Pumpkins are high in water content and they, so it's a great way to incorporate water into the process so that things keep continuing to move fluidly and, and the system keeps ro rolling, you know, at an optimum level. Um, we're also going to contact the Columbus Zoo to see because sometimes uh, pumpkins can be used as uh, food stock for the zoo animals. So we're going to be looking at that as well. And I'll, I'll announce the dates as we get closer. And as far as any issues that we've experienced through 40 weeks, uh, you can see this little guy, oh yes, it's garbage night. Um, if we're able to get your food waste out of your waste stream, um, it, it reduces the amount of animals and, and rodents and things that you have at your house. And since we have the types of containers that we have, we've only had one instance where the demand has exceeded the capacity. Somebody came in and all of our containers were full and it was early on. And we had, it, it happened on Saturday night and Go Zero came on Sunday. So it was on the ground less than 12 hours and it was taken away. So, um, and that really was, it happened last fall and it was caused because people were dumping pumpkins into the 65 gallon container. So that took up a whole lot of space and a lot of wasted space because obviously pumpkins are large. And if you don't break them down, that minimizes the amount of space that people have for other things. So we're gonna be on top of that this year. But as far as the, the containers and the corral being within a hundred feet of our front door, we haven't had any rats, raccoons, possums, skunks, groundhogs, or anything getting in the containers, mostly because they are covered. They have a lid on them and it keeps things out. Um, we haven't had any smells. Uh, we've measured within 50 feet of the corral. We still haven't had any smell. Um, we haven't had any insects yet. Um, we do anticipate a little bit of insect, you know, just listening to other communities, but there, there is like a, a vinegar mixture that we can use to keep the bugs down and we haven't had any illegal dumping. dumping. And the community, you know, as far as purity, um, we've been getting nines and 10 is, is the best possible outcome. So you know, everybody has embraced this and they're using it properly. And it's, it's really a model program for a lot of the, you know, for Worthington and Hilliard and Grove City and Upper Arlington. You know, we've, we really have a model program and a lot of people are um, using ours as a model on what to do. Uh, there are plans to expand. Um, we just need to find a location. Uh, we, we're hoping to put one maybe in a historic Dublin or, you know, in the Bridge Street area where the apartment complexes are and, and where there's a lot of activity. You know, it, it's a good opportunity for us to capture that food waste, all the restaurants and things down there. Um, and here are pictures of, of other programs. One is Upper Arlington and the other one is Westerville. Um, just kind of an idea of, of what some of the other communities are, are doing. Um, and, you know, I'm a little biased, but I think our, our location is set up pretty, pretty darn nicely. So we're, we're really proud of it. 
And then for more information, uh, you can go to DublinOhioUSA.gov and just click on the link to sign up. Um, there's also information you know, with Swaco, which is Swaco, C-W-R-G, at Swaco.org. They also have a lot of really good information about recycling on the website. And then also go zero, they'll tell you anything and everything that you wanna know about composting and probably some things you don't wanna know. So those are places to get information. And you can buy the compost that comes from Dublin. Uh, you can contact Go Zero by the website. And we just recommend that because of the high nitrogen content, um, it has almost double the nutrients of traditional compost. And that's because you know, food waste is such a rich, rich compostable item. Um, and it has three times the nutrients of potting blends. And you can order by mail. I don't have any of the pricing, I don't think, but just make sure you don't use as much as you would normally use or you'll burn up your plants. And with that, I think that is it. If anybody has any questions, and then this is my information. I can be contacted at the city of Dublin. My office is located at 6555 Shire Rings Road. Uh, phone number is on there and also my email. So email is a really good way to, to, I generally answer all emails sometimes before I'm even able to answer the phone um, because I am in and out checking on Rumpke and checking on the chipping crew and checking on, I'm in and out of the office a lot. So the best way to catch me is by email. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to field those questions and answer them to the best of my Thank ability. You. Thank yep. you, Michael, so, Thank you so much. much. I, um, you're probably on cicada control as well since you've managed the mosquitoes also, huh? <laughs> uh, cicadas, not yet. So, not yet. But yeah, I don't think they're, uh, the cicadas aren't really a health hazard, um, but the mosquitoes definitely are with the West Nile and everything else. So we, yeah. We keep track of those, but I, 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 it is weird to think that there are animals coming out of the ground that were created during George Bush's time. Yeah, <laughs> we did have a couple questions from Barbara, um, okay. and I think that we all have experienced this. Actually, the recycling uh, company is coming through our neighborhood just now. I'm with the city of Columbus. Okay. When, when the recycling all gets dumped in together, I think mm -hmm. I have heard this. Maybe this is rumor. Um, but when, when all of these items come and they put them in the truck together, the glass, the paper, the plastics, they have people that sort what can be recycled and what cannot. Is that correct? They, they, have, they have people that sort and they also, most of it is done through machines. Most of the sorting is done through machines. And they have a material recovery facility on Fields Avenue. Rumke owns it. It's a big building that used to be a, I, I guess it used to be a slaughterhouse once upon a time, but they have converted it into a recycling recovery facility. And the trucks go in, you know, whether it's Republic, local waste, Rumpy, whoever, waste management, they dump everything into a large pile. There's a big loader that pushes it on a conveyor and then it, it's tripped through the facility and the, um, the conveyors move about 65 mile an hour through there and they have a lot of electronic eyes that will shoot um, jets of air depending on what kind of plastic it is. And the way the air will hit the bottle will pop the bottle off the conveyor line into like number two bottles or number one bottle. And then the glass moves on to a crusher. Um, cardboard is, is also separated mechanically with like gravity wheels. It's really just a neat, a yeah. neat place to go visit, to think that all of that stuff can be sorted by machines and technology and electronic eyes and jets of air and all of these things, I mean, is, is really kind of neat. Yeah. So Her Michael, other question reflected uh, can on- I, Can I ask sure. further on that question? Yep. Because what I really wondered was, um, in one of the neighborhoods in Wyandotte Woods condos, they have recycling bins and trash bins, but they said when their guys pick up, they're dumping both bins in the same truck. So that's what, like, how is that being recycled if it's all being dumped together? Is it not just going in the landfill? 
Okay, that, that I'm glad you answered that question because it's there's a lot of layers to that onion. Um, so sometimes people get the it, it can happen both ways, and I'll give you both scenarios. So the first scenario is you know sometimes people call in and they say hey they're throwing trash and recycling into the same truck and that's all going to landfill. Well, the same truck you know it may be on the trash route first and collects all the trash, takes it to landfill, gets rid of it, and they'll use the same truck to pick up the recycling. That happens a lot. Um, and under, you know, once they pick up the recycling, then it goes to the MRF. Um, that happens a lot, oddly, you know, that people get that confused. But when people say that they have stand there and they watch them put the trash into the, into the truck and then they grab the, immediately grab the recycling, put it into a truck, it, that material will end up at the MRF, you know, and they may be at the end of the route, recycling route, and they're just trying to save time. Um, but that recycling will not go, I promise you, that will not go to landfill because Rumkey has to pay to get rid of things at the landfill. And it's all based on tonnage. So if you are adding recycling tonnage to trash tonnage, and you're paying to get rid of both tonnages at the landfill, that's counterproductive for your business plan and your cash flow. Right. I think so, that condo has a different company. I don't know the name of it. It's not Rumkey though, that goes in there. So okay. they're, if it's they're probably just not following the same protocols maybe. Right. So if it's a different company, it, it may be going to the landfill because there is nothing that says nothing legally unless they have a contract you know, that says they have to separate recycling from trash. And, you know, if it's waste management or Republic, whoever it is, they have to pay to take that tonnage if it's recycling to Rumkey because Rumkey has the only recovery facility. Okay. So it's highly unlikely if they're throwing everything into both, you know, into one truck, that's probably going to the landfill because they have to pay to get rid of it anyway which is really unfortunate, you know. Um, there, there's a lot of different ways around that and a lot of it is education, you know, based regarding, you know, what local knows and what local brothers or, you know, whoever, you know, if they were able to, they, they would be able to reduce the amount of cost that they would experience taking things to the landfill if they would do a recycling container next to it and use different trucks because you pay right. less to take recycling to the MRF as opposed to everything to landfill. Maybe so in it, that just, area they can investigate it a little closer but the part that really bothered me about it was it's really deceptive for them to have a recycling bin which is actually the same size as the trash bin it's just blue yep. and their yep. trash bins are brown and then so the people that are this is like an, I think you have to be 55 or older to live in this condo association. Mm -hmm. So the people who live there, they think they're recycling. So that's what I wanted to know is if it's going to the landfill, it's pretty deceptive to provide a recycling bin. Right. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's not the most ethical business plan in the world. If you're doing that, you know, it's, it, it is shady, unfortunately. And, you know, that's, Part of working for Rumkey, I saw that a lot, you know, and it, it was maddening being a, a salesman, you know, when I started with Rumkey as an outdoor salesman and I'm trying to get our containers placed at these locations. Well, we already recycle and I know darn well they're not, you know, so I'm trying to beat them on price and, you know, it just depends on what the residents know, you know, and for that company, it may make sense to haul everything to landfill, but the selling point was Yep, we'll put, put a new different kind of container in there and but it all ends up in the same truck then I'll tell you that. So I think the other question Barbara had was also on the if you didn't receive one of the 500 food waste buckets provided mm -hmm. by Dublin through the grant, um, there could also be other people that are perhaps uh, using a bucket for their food waste and dropping it off to the food site. Is that sure. correct as well? Yeah, you can you can purchase five gallon buckets at 
uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, the, you know, they're famous or any hardware store, just a, an ordinary five gallon bucket. Um, let's see if I can I'll start my video here. There we go. Um, there's nothing special about this bucket other than as the Go Zero emblem. Um, this is the compostable liner that you can, that it comes with this particular bucket, but you can buy them at, at you know, Whole Foods or Fresh Time or anybody that, that sells uh, these kind of containers and liners. Uh, but Lowe's bucket works fine. Um, we have people that use Tupperware containers, you know, maybe they're single or, you know, they don't want this sitting around for a week and a half to fill up <laughs> everything. So they're, you know, they're out here every other day anyway, for one reason or another. So Great. Tupperware containers, ice cream containers, you know, whatever and you want to use. Barbara had yeah. also made the comment, are people being trained or is it thought to ask them to put in sawdust or leaves or something else that might reduce the, eliminate the odors? as they're waiting for the food to de decompose. Yeah, the lid does a pretty good job. It, this, this container does come with a lid. It goes right on top and you can see how the liner kind of overhangs the bucket. And as you put things in it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't pull the liner down. So, um, you know, basically the lid, that seals up pretty good. And then when you're done, you just, bring it, dump it in a green container, you know, the liner and all can go with it. And then you don't have all that stuff stuck to the inside. You just rinse it out. Put a new I was interested and you're good to go. I was interested so, in the vinegar solution that you were talking about for your, is that a particular thing that you're, you're uh, purchasing like, for Dublin? It, we haven't had to use it yet, but it's like three parts vinegar to one part water and bugs really hate it. So they, they stay away. And, Good. you know, you'll be smelling vinegar as opposed to rotten food, and then you're not accosted by flies or whatever else is there. So, you know, it's just really, it's a hygiene thing for our area, you know, to keep the, to keep the compost corral and the containers presentable. But we haven't, we haven't had to do it yet. So, sure. yeah, so we don't know. But we, okay. that is something that we've learned from other communities that had to deal with it. So if that should happen, that's what we're going to do. That's the plan that's in place. But honestly, we haven't had to deal with it yet. I would, my go-to is baking soda. It's always has been put baking soda in the refrigerator to draw the odors. Um, I suppose you could put some baking soda in your compost as well. Is that correct? Um, if you want to do that, um, I have heard of people putting like, you know, when they put their food food waste in this, they like put a newspaper down over top of it. I guess that works too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we want to keep yard waste and things like that out because we only have a certain amount of room in those containers. And then when we add containers or add services, our cost goes up, which we're, we're prepared for, but we just don't want to do it unnecessarily, you know? Sure. Okay. Well, Michael and Barbara, I thank you so much for being part of our Get Outside, Go Green. And I certainly hope that you'll be with us in October uh, when we have an in-person event. We can educate, have an opportunity to educate some more people on, on the initiatives to help our little pollinators and then also help um, our water resources and our land resources. So. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I appreciate those who have joined us here today, uh, mostly by phone.